Hello students, today we meet again to talk about dissociative disorders. All of us at some point in time or, or the other in our life have felt a feeling of strangeness as though we are not ourselves, as though the world around us is not true, as though there is something which is unreal which is happening, as though we have detached ourselves away from us, as though we don't know what we are. It's not very common. It does not happen too often to us as well. Studies say that many people, especially children and adolescents, have these dissociative experiences which I am talking about. That is the feelings of strangeness. Strangeness involves a brief spell of memory loss or identity confusion or something related to a loss of your own identity in course of normal life. Mild dissociative symptoms are recognized by us, by each and every one of us. Just as we have discussed till now, we do realize that there has been some problem with us. There is something that we have missed out in our daily routine. Like for example, when you daydream and you lose track of what is happening around you. When we walk ahead, crossing our destination and we feel lost, where am I? Is the question that you ask yourself. Or we miss out on a part of conversation that we have been hearing. In all these circumstances, we immediately realize that there has been some problem. We identify that we have missed something, that we have crossed our destination, that we have been lost for a moment in our thoughts. Morton Prince, who is the founder of the Journal of Abnormal Psychology, about 100 years ago has talked about people experiencing something like dissociation occasionally. When does this dissociation occur? Such experiences are most likely to happen after an extremely stressful incident, for example an accident. When you are tired, when one is extremely tired physically and psychologically, when one is under physical or psychological pressures. But perhaps since one, we know the cause, one knows the cause, the dissociation does not actually affect the person much and not for long time. Transient experiences of dissociation occur in about half of the general population and so at some point in time in their lives, it is said. Studies show, especially if someone experiences a traumatic situation, at least about 31% to 66%, that is between 31% to 66% of the people will have this feeling of dissociation. However, when we talk from abnormal psychology point of view, dissociative disorders go far beyond these temporary and momentary experiences that we have been talking about so far. Now, what do dissociative disorders involve? Dissociative disorders involve the dissociation or splitting apart of components of personality which are normally integrated. As a result, some psychological function, be it your identity or memory or perception of oneself or the environment is screened out of your consciousness. The dissociative disorders may occur without any demonstrable damage to the brain. This kind of pathological dissociation may not have much of a genetic component. Instead, they have an origin in some severe psychological stress. And they develop as a result of a failure of coping with that stress. These dissociative disorders appear as ways of avoiding anxiety, avoiding stress, avoiding severe tension and of managing life problems which threaten to overwhelm the person's usual coping resources. They enable the individual to deny the personal responsibility altogether so that his or her unacceptable wishes or behavior are not known to his own self. DSM-4TR, as you all know, the classification which is uh, in vogue now, DSM Diagnostic Statistical Manual, the version is for TR, TR is for text revision as you all know, 
This recognizes several types of pathological dissociation where the person avoids stress by pathologically dissociating from the situation that is by escaping his or her own autobiographical memory about his own self what I mean or personal identity. Let us have a brief look at this slide to see what are the major categories of disorders which are classified under dissociative disorders. The first and foremost that we are going to talk about today is depersonalization disorders. We will also talk about dissociative amnesia. We will talk about dissociative fugue. We will also talk about dissociative identity disorder maybe in the next section. As of now, we will also include one more disorder called dissociative trans disorder. This disorder is not included in DSM classification yet, but it is recommended that DSM-5 classification should involve this disorder. Depersonalization disorders, let us first start with a study. There was a study done at Stanford University which surveyed the reactions of a set of journalists. These journalists have actually witnessed one of the first executions in California. Now the study results have shown that at least 40 to 60 percent of these journalists have shown severe dissociative symptoms. Remember they have witnessed a execution, they have witnessed an execution. For example, during execution, things around them seemed unreal, they looked dreamlike and they felt that the time has really stopped. They have also felt estranged from people and distant from their own emotions and a number of them felt that they were strangers to themselves. In this example that we have talked about, the experiences which the journalists have faced, some of us may have faced under some traumatic experience or the other or at some point in time of, of our life or the other. Now these kinds of experiences can be divided into two types. Let us first talk about the first type which is depersonalization. Depersonalization is an episode where a person's perceptions alter so that he temporarily loses the sense of his own reality. On the other hand, there is another type of depersonalization disorder which is called derealization. This derealization is an episode where the sense of reality of the external world is totally lost. Now such depersonalization or derealization disorders occur during stress disorders or during panic attacks as well. Let us talk a little more about this depersonalization disorder. In depersonalization disorder, as I said earlier, one's sense of one's own self and one's own reality is temporarily lost. Like other dissociative disorders that we are going to discuss today shortly, um, for example, fugue or dissociative identity disorder, even this depersonalization disorder involves a disruption of personal identity. However, the disruption occurs without any amnesia. The central feature of this syndrome that is depersonalization disorder is as the word suggests depersonalization that is a sense of strangeness or unreality about one's own self. In derealization disorder on the other hand, one's sense of the reality of the outside world is temporarily lost. Let us now look at this slide which shows what are the DSM-4 criteria for depersonalization disorder. Persistent or recurrent experiences of feeling detached from one's mental processes or body and during this experience reality testing remains intact. It causes significant distress or impairment in functioning. It does not occur exclusively during the course of another mental disorder such as schizophrenia, panic disorder, acute stress disorder or another dissociative disorder and is not due to the direct physiological effects of a substance. For example, a drug of abuse or medication or general medical condition, for example, a temporal lobe epilepsy. This is according to DSM-4 TR as I have already mentioned according to American Psychiatric Association and this as you all know DSM-4 TR has been published in 2000. Now let's talk a little more about 
depersonalization. People with depersonalization disorder feel as though they have been cut off from themselves and they are viewing themselves from somewhere outside and they are functioning as though they are robots or as though they are living in a dream. This sense of strangeness usually extends to the body. Patients may feel as though their extremities have grown or shrunk, as though their bodies are operating mechanically, as I said, robotic, or as though they are dead, or as though they are imprisoned inside the body, or they are somebody else who is imprisoned inside this body. These feelings of strangeness in the self, which is related to depersonalization, are often accompanied by what is called derealization that we have discussed a little earlier. This is a feeling of strangeness about the world, as we know. Other people, like oneself, seem robotic, dead or somehow unreal, as though they are actors in a play. People experiencing depersonalization or derealization for that matter, may also have what is called the episodes of deja vu. I, ho I hope you have heard this word deja vu earlier. It's a French word for already seen. This is a sense of having been in a place or situation before when one actually knows that you didn't, you have never been in that place. On the other hand, they may have the opposite experience, Jamai's view, a French word for never seen. The sense when one is in a familiar place or situation of not having seen it ever as though you have never seen it before. These two are opposite word, words. Either that may happen or this may happen. Depersonalization often involves reduced emotional responsiveness, a loss of interest in others and the world in particular in general. People afflicted with this depersonalization do not lose touch with reality. They know that their perceptions of strangeness are not right, they are wrong. Nevertheless, these perceptions are frightening to the individual. The person may feel that he or she is going to go insane, mad. Now what could be the factors which may contribute to this kind of problem? Let us look at the slide. In the view of cognitive psychology, depersonalization and derealization constitute a failure of recognition memory. The person is unable to match the current experience with past experience as might happen on entering a familiar room which has been redecorated according to Kilstrom. PET scans according to researchers like Simon et al have shown abnormalities in the visual, auditory and somatosensory association areas of the posterior cortex. Also studies have shown that they have been linked with childhood trauma, particularly emotional abuse. The onset of depersonalization disorder may either be sudden or gradual and the condition is usually chronic. Amnesia is a term which I am sure you people must have heard, you must have seen in movies, you must have read in books, multiple number of movies have been made using this as one of the concepts. But then let us distinguish between two types of amnesia. Basically, let us talk about what amnesia means. Amnesia is a partial or total forgetting of the past experiences. Now there are two types of amnesia, one is retrograde amnesia. Retrograde amnesia is a partial or total inability to recall or identify previously acquired information or past experiences. On the other hand, anterograde amnesia is the partial or total inability to retain new information. Amnesia may be caused by a blow to the head or by any one of a number of brain disorders. These are the reasons behind organic am amnesia. However, some amnesias occur without any apparent neurological cause or an organic cause. They occur as a result of a psychological stress. Let us look at the distinguishing features between 
organic amnesia and dissociative amnesia. Dissociative amnesia or we call it as psychogenic amnesia as well. It's almost always anterograde. I have just explained to you what anterograde amnesia means. And this blots out a period of time after the precipitating stress. Remember we talked about the psychological stress. For example, there may be gaps in memory following a heavy stressful situation like wartime combat conditions or catastrophic events. For example, serious car accidents or any other accidents, suicide attempts or violent outbursts. On the other hand, organic amnesia, particularly from a head injury, is usually retrograde, erasing a period of time prior to the precipitating event. Dissociative amnesia is often selective. The blank period tends to include events which most people would want to forget, very strongly want to forget. For example, a trauma or an unacceptable action such as an extramarital affair. People with dissociative amnesia are often much less disturbed as compared to those with organic amnesia over their condition. This indifference may be explained um, as a relief from the conflict. Most people with dissociative amnesia remain well oriented with time and place and they have little problem learning new skills, new information. Whereas in organic amnesias, typically there is involved some disorientation and difficulty with new learning. Finally, because the events which are forgotten in dissociative amnesia are simply screened out of consciousness rather than lost altogether as is the case in organic amnesia they can often be recovered under hypnotic trance or with the aid of certain barbiturates like sodium amytal or lorazepam a benzodiazepine so this is according to Kilstrom has said this now let us look at the diagnostic criteria for dissociative amnesia. Let us look at a slide now. The first and foremost according to DSM 4 TR 2000 is that the predominant disturbance is one or more episodes or inability to recall important personal information usually of a traumatic or stressful nature that is too extensive to be explained by ordinary forgetfulness. The disturbance does not occur exclusively during the course of dissociative identity disorder, dissociative fugue, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, acute stress disorder or somatization disorder and is not due to the direct physiological effects of a substance. For example, a drug of abuse or a medication or a neurological or other general medical condition. For example, amnestic disorder due to head trauma. The symptoms cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational or other important areas of functioning. Now, dissociative amnesia may display itself in a variety of forms of memory loss. There are certain patterns that you see in this memory loss. Let us discuss about five broad patterns of memory loss in amnesia, dissociative amnesia. The first and foremost is the localized amnesia. Localized amnesia is the most common condition that we usually come across in uh, amnesia. All events occurring during a circumscribed period of time are blocked out. For example, let us take the uh, case of a man who has survived a fire accident where the all the other members of his family, that is the rest of his family has died. He might have no memory of anything which happened from the time of fire until maybe about three days later. Now the second type of amnesia that I would like to discuss with you today is selective amnesia. In this kind of amnesia, the person makes spot erasures. 
he forgets only certain events which occurred during a circumscribed period of time as in the earlier uh, kind of amnesia but only certain events. For example, in the same case that we have discussed for localized amnesia, the man might recall the fire engines coming and the ambulance taking him to the hospital but he forgets seeing his children being carried out of the house and identifying their bodies the next day. Another type of amnesia is generalized amnesia where the person forgets his or her entire life though this kind of amnesia is something which tends to feature very often in movies and novels it's actually rare. The next type of amnesia is continuous amnesia. This is also rare. The person forgets all events which have occurred after a specific period of time up to the present, including events which have occurred after the on onset of amnesia. Like for example, if the amnesia has started on Monday, the person does not know on Wednesday what he or she did on Tuesday too. Systematized amnesia is the fifth type I would like to discuss with you today. The person forgets only certain categories of information, for example, all the information about his own family, whereas the other memories remain intact. Now, what are the major features of dissociative amnesia? Dissociative amnesia may involve no disorientation. The exceptions are of course generalized and continuous amnesia where all or much of the person's past is blocked out. Patients with this form of amnesia do not know who they are, where they are, they do not recognize their own family or friends and they cannot tell their own name, address or anything related to themselves. In other words, the episodic memory or memory of personal experience is lost. Typically, however, the semantic memory or the general knowledge is spared. For instance, a person who cannot identify a picture of his own wife may recognize the picture of, a, of, of John Kennedy. This was said by Kopelman and um, others. Procedural memory or the memory for skills is also usually intact. Victims can read, they can write and they can add and subtract as well. In most cases though, even episodic memory is partially erased. Explicit memories, that is the memories that we are aware of, may be gone. But often the person shows evidence of having implicit memories, that is memories that he or she cannot call into conscious awareness, but still can affect their behavior, according to Kilstrom. We have so far talked about dissociative amnesia. Now let us compare it with fugue. Fugue is a condition where the person not only forgets all or most of his or her past, but also takes a sudden unexpected trip away from home. It's a sort of traveling amnesia, but it is more elaborate than amnesia. While people with amnesia in their confusion may wander about aimlessly, Fugue, on the other hand, makes the patients who are affected purposeful in their actions. While amnesia patients may forget their identity, many fugue patients go one step ahead and they manufacture a new identity. Now, the length and elaborateness of fugue varies considerably. Usual pattern is seen when some people may go no farther than a day, you know, they go to the next town or city and then they go in, uh, they, they spend the day in a movie theater and then they check into a hotel and then uh, under an assumed name, of course, I said, they cook up a new identity, right, and recover by morning. In rare cases, however, patients travel to far off foreign countries, assume a new identity, fabricate a detailed past and pursue an altogether new life for months or even years. During the fugue, they appear fairly normal to observers because they have forgotten everything about their past and they have developed a new identity and they have assumed a new identity and they are living a new life altogether. Finally, however, they do wake up 
often after a jolting reminder of their former life or as it appears in some cases simply when once again they feel psychologically safe according to writer and Stoudemire. Fugue usually remits suddenly and when fugue victims do wake up they are completely amnesic for the events that have occurred during fugue. The last thing that they may remember is leaving home one day, one morning, one fine morning. The second stage amnesia that we are talking about now is what usually brings a fugue victim to professional attention. They seek therapy only when the fugue ends partly because they want to find out what they have done during this fugue state. Like amnesia, fugue is also generally rare but is more common during wartime and other natural disasters according to Coons. Again, like amnesia, it tends to occur after a severe psychological trauma and it seems to function as an escape from severe psychological stress. It would be interesting to you to note that fugue is a term derived from the Latin word flight. Let us talk about dissociative trance disorder. As I have told you, uh, this is not yet included in DSM classification, but there are recommendations that this has to be included. Now, dissociative disorders differ in important ways across the cultures. Not all cultures show same kinds of dissociative disorders. In many areas of the world, dissociative phenomena may occur as a trance or a possession. The usual sorts of dissociative symptoms such as sudden changes in personality that we have been talking about earlier are attributed to possession by a spirit or something like that in a few cultures. Often this spirit what it does is it demands and receives as well the presence or favours from the family and friends of the victim. Like other dissociative states, trans disorder seems to be most common in women and is often associated once again with stress and trauma which is current rather than based some time in the past. Trance and possession are a common part of some traditional religious and cultural practices. Let us look at this slide to see which areas of the world uh, demonstrate this kind of disorder. Trance and possession are a common part of some traditional religious and cultural practices and are not considered abnormal in that particular context in certain parts of the world. Dissociative trances commonly occur in India, Nigeria, there they are called Vinbusai, in Thailand they are called Phaiprob and other Asian and African countries according to Mexican others, Saxena, Prasad, Vanduzi and others. In United States, culturally accepted dissociation commonly occurs during African-American prayer meetings according to Griffith and others and Native American rituals according to Gillick and Puerto Rican spiritist sessions according to Commerce Dals. Bahamians and African-Americans from the South among them, trans syndromes are often referred to colloquially as falling out. There was a study done in Singapore where personality profiles of 58 cases of dissociative trans disorder were examined. They were derived from objective testing and they revealed that these individuals tend to be nervous, excitable and emotionally unstable relative to normals. A category to include these states as I have already told you has been proposed for DSM-5.